Hello, all my history-loving friends. We are in Joplin today. If you are new to my channel, this is a history channel. I do a little bit of true crime, a little bit uh, disasters. I do fun stuff too, funny stuff. Uh, the Cobra Scare is a funny one. Um, wasn't funny to the people that lived through it, but now since someone got hurt, we can consider it funny. So basically anything I find interesting, I may do a video on it and hopefully you find it interesting too. So if you would like to see more like this, like, subscribe, and all that jazz. I'm in Joplin outside the apartment where Bonnie and Clyde's most famous shootout happened. They started renting this apartment about April 1st of 1933, and the shootout occurred on April 13th. Those two weeks were probably the happiest that the couple had. They were here with W.D. Jones, who was 16 years old, uh, one of their accomplices. They also were here with Buck and Blanche. Buck was Clyde's brother, his older brother. Everyone in the Barrow family had a nickname, so Buck was actually his nickname. I'm going to have to look up what his real name was. Uh, it's escaping me right now. Um, and then Clyde's nickname was Bud. Buck and Blanche rented this apartment on April 1st under an assumed name. They paid $50 for it. This was a very nice neighborhood at the time. There was actually a night watchman who was paid to walk through here. And Buck and Blanche, he paid him a dollar to really look in on this property and watch their cars and Bonnie and Clyde thought that was absolutely hilarious. They really enjoyed their time here. The only reason Buck came, he felt responsible for Clyde getting involved in his life of crime because he got him started stealing cars and so he wanted to talk him out of living like he was to either get out of crime or get out of the country. Turn yourself in or you can go live in Mexico. There's all kinds of countries where you could go live. And he swore to Blanche he was done with crime, but he didn't even make it three weeks. So despite the fact Clyde said they had enough money to live here without doing any jobs, they were drinking a case of beer a night because while they stayed here, prohibition went away. And in Missouri, it was legal to drink beer again. Unfortunately, a case of beer every single night plus paying for laundry service and paying for people to bring you groceries. Clyde would never let any of these delivery people come in the house. They had to meet Blanche or Bonnie in the stairwell, which this door leads into a stairwell. And at the top of the stairs is the door to the apartment. And so you see that there's a door there going into the garage and that door's gonna be important when we get to the, the shootout. Their money ran out and so WD and Clyde and sometimes Buck were disappearing. Clyde wasn't always smart and would uh, draw attention to himself that wasn't necessary. So they're going off and they're pulling these jobs off around the area. They robbed an armory while they were staying here, came back with a bunch of BARs and uh, other lethal weapons and Blanche was horrified by this because of course she had been promised there wasn't going to be anything like that going on while she was here and that Buck wasn't going to be involved in anything like that. Clearly he had broken his promise. When they were staying here they always kept the blinds closed but Blanche couldn't stand having the blinds closed so she always kept them open in the bedroom she shared with Buck. So Blanche and Buck had a bedroom and then Bonnie and Clyde had the other and I'm not sure where WD slept. I guess he just slept on the couch maybe or. I'm gonna guess those two are the bedrooms with the, maybe the bathroom there in the middle. This is not correct. They were not here for several months. They hold up here for, from April 1st to April 13th. Not quite two weeks. The way they wild away their time here, the women would go shopping. They were able to set up house even though it was furnished, they had to go and buy bedding and towels, utensils for the kitchen, just things they would need to, to set up house. And the women really enjoyed that. They would go off shopping and, you know, buy things they needed. But Blanche said they also bought some things they didn't need. Like, uh, they bought some costume jewelry that looked like it was diamonds, but it really, it really wasn't. And they didn't steal it. Although later it, it, they tried to claim that 
they had stolen a bunch of actual diamond jewelry, which they had not. Bonnie made a friend of a little girl who lived around here. Her name was Beth. People in the neighborhood, though, found the, the behavior of the people living here odd. They stayed up all hours of the night. So Blanche said they would stay up drinking beer. They would be playing poker. Poker was a game she said she was terrible at, even though Buck tried to teach her. She just really didn't want to learn. So she bought some puzzles, which in the 1930s, puzzles became really popular because everyone was poor and didn't have money to do anything. So you could buy a puzzle and enjoy that over and over again. She had bought puzzles and she said that even though at first some of the guys made fun of her, Clyde came around and he started to enjoy them too. But they would stay up super late, then they would sleep late into the morning. That's not something that people very commonly did back then. One time, Clyde was cleaning his Browning automatic rifle and it accidentally went off. So that drew the attention of everyone in the neighborhood. And actually that is what made people in the neighborhood contact the police and say, there's something weird going on with these people. And on April 12th, WD went to Miami, Oklahoma and stole a V8 and brought it back here which that drew a lot of attention and that made Bonnie really angry and she and Clyde had a huge fight on the night of the 12th to the extent that he actually threw her across the room according to Blanche. He would hit her but uh, she would hit him right back. By then though Clyde had decided that they had spent enough time here and he thought that the police were probably on to them at this point. They were packing on the 13th and getting ready to leave. Bonnie had just got up. She was still in her nightgown. She had asked Blanche to boil an egg for her. Now Blanche writes in her memoir that Bonnie hated cooking. She hated cleaning up. She was just not someone who would be a good housewife, I guess. And so Blanche felt like she had to do more than her fair share of cleaning up and cooking. Usually Blanche and Clyde did the cooking. And she said that Buck and Bonnie liked pickled pig's feet and olives and Clyde loved this cream pea recipe so it was peas with a lot of cream and pepper and he ate that for every meal except breakfast. So getting back to that morning she asked Blanche to boil an egg for her. They were packing their stuff getting ready to go. Buck serviced the car, the Marmon. Um, he changed the oil, he took it and filled it with gas. After servicing the car, Buck came back and he was taking a nap upstairs when all of this started. And he would have ran down this staircase to start helping Clyde and WD. And WD and Clyde took off in the V8, probably to do another job. But as the ladies are sitting inside, they hear the V8 come back. The reason the V8 had come back is because it was having engine trouble, but as they were lowering the door, the police pulled up. So the police and highway patrol, they had decided to raid this apartment. They thought the people living here were probably either bootleggers or involved in car theft rings. Yes, prohibition was being eased in Missouri, but beer was only the only thing legal. So they thought maybe they were distilling the hard stuff. So as he is lowering this garage door, one of these garage doors, the police pull up. They're in two cars. One of the cars possibly pulls up where mine is right here. I don't know. They said the car pulled up along the curb, just a little past the apartment. The first car contained Officer Kaler and Officer Grammer. The second car pulls into the driveway where I'm standing. It pulled into the driveway so that it blocked both of these doors. It had three officers in it. It had Officer McGinnis, Officer Harriman, Officer DeGraft. Wes Harriman was a constable. So he did this as a supplement to his income. He was actually a farmer and he was paid per warrant. He was there because he, he was with the county and he was able to serve the search warrant. He jumped out of the car first. And Officer DeGraff yelled at him to keep the door from coming down to get in. He got off one shot but as he did so, Clyde fired his shotgun at him and he hit Harriman in the neck and shoulder and basically he bled out within seconds. His body was laying at the corner of the left-hand door, which is the one they were trying to close. And all of this is happening in seconds. 
McGinnis jumps out of the car. He gets off three shots. He actually fires through one of these windows. It said three shots through one of the glass windows of the garage. One of the shots McGinnis fired hit WD in the abdomen. He also was hit by a shotgun blast. It almost took off his arm. It kind of got him in the chest, the arm, a little bit in the face. He did not die immediately. The third officer, DeGraft, he gets out and he grabs McGinnis's gun and he hides along the side of the building, which I feel like that's gonna be over here. Officer Kaler, meanwhile, he hides behind his car. I think Kaler probably pulled up where my car is parked. And the reason I say that is because the door that went into the stairwell was absolutely riddled with bullets. And I'm going to show that to you in our next video when I show you everything that was found in the apartment. It is in a museum here in Joplin. Also, one of their shotguns is in, was left behind. It is in a Galena, Kansas pawn shop. And I saw that as well. So that will be in my next video. Taylor is behind his car and he is firing a pistol at them. Taylor tells Grammer to go for help. McGinnis fired three shots into the garage. One of them hit WD. WD then comes out and he staggers up these stairs and he meets the women and they have no idea what's going on. He's covered in blood. His shirt is just drenched in blood. Oh, so they know we have to leave and we have to leave now and they didn't have time to take any of their things. Blanche had a little dog with her named Snowball. Snowball ran off and Blanche ran after him. Everybody else climbs into the car. They get in the V8. When they opened the garage door, they saw that Harriman's body and DeGraff's car blocked their escape. Buck pulled the body out of the car's path. And WD and Clyde tried to push the car. So after everyone got into the car, Clyde rammed it as hard as he could and knocked it out of the way. They drive off and uh, presumably Blanche is running down the street. And Buck, probably Buck, grabs her and pulls her inside. Before they drove off, Kaler continues to fire at them. But it's not a very powerful one. It's just a little pistol. And he gets Clyde in the chest, but it hits a button on Clyde's shirt, and it doesn't actually penetrate. Later, Bonnie is able to remove that bullet using only her fingernails and a bobby pin. And Buck is also hit, and he just gets a little bruise on his chest. So once they drive away and they drive past Kaler, he no longer fires at them because he knows his gun cannot penetrate the car. I mean, it couldn't even hit them from not very far away. After the gunfire stops, McGinnis is barely clinging to life. The first thing he says is to ask how Harriman is doing. They lie to him and tell him that he's okay. And I think it's really touching and says a lot about Detective that he immediately thought of other people rather than himself. He would die later that evening, mostly from shock and blood loss. McGinnis was to have gotten married within the next few weeks. He had lost his first wife a couple of years before that. Officer Harriman, who was only around 41 years old, left behind five children and a wife. He probably wouldn't have made more than a couple of dollars for serving this warrant. What makes the shootout so important is not the shootout itself, but what Bonnie and Clyde and the gang left behind. And in our next episode, I will be telling you about the things they left behind, why they are important, and why we still talk about Bonnie and Clyde 87 years after they died. I'll see you all next time.